right, we're going to continue our look at the Mex Mexican National Unit. Uh, we're going to focus on the Louisiana Purchase here, and we'll talk about some of the other reasons why um, Spain begins to really lose a lot of power during the 1800s to the 1820s. So we'll look kind of at the overview of that, um, focusing a little bit on the Louisiana Purchase here, especially right here at the beginning. So why did Spain's presence in Texas go from tremendously weak in 1800 to the brink of complete collapse by 1820? Well, big problem is the United States is your new neighbor. Uh, and when we look here, um, the Louisiana Purchase of this territory happens in 1803. Well, this land was Spanish land up until 1800. If you'll remember in the last video, we talked about at the end of the French and Indian War, Spain gained this territory as a result of the French and Indian War. So Spain gains this territory, and this is, is good news for Spain. Um, the United, uh, the, the colonies, the British colonies, control, or, and Great Britain controls all of this territory, and Spain controls all of this territory. Well, that's good, and that's fine, and that's the way it is from the mid-1760s all the way until about 1800, when Spain has been weakened over time, uh, they have, they're not uh, as doing as well as they had been uh, through a series of losses and different uh, military um, expeditions and fights uh, it, throughout Europe during the, the seven, late 1700s. And so um, Spain has been weakened, and through a treaty that they make with France, they give that territory to France. So Spain gives that Louisiana territory to France in 1800, um, and Napoleon is the new uh, leader in France. So France has become a republic, and then Napoleon sets himself up as a dictator, and Spain gives that territory to France in 1800. Well, from 1800 to 1803, France has it, but France is now having trouble their wars are expensive and, and Napoleon needs money. And so he sells the Louisiana Territory to the United States. And all of a sudden now, when they had just given that land to France just a few years before, now all of a sudden, instead of having France, who's busy fighting war in Europe as a neighbor, they now have the United States, which is busy moving west and the population is growing and people are moving west, west, moving west. And now the United States has all this territory and that is a problem for Spain. They see this as a problem and they're not gonna be pleased about it um, because one of the big issues here is that you can see the boundary here. Well, what does the boundary include? It includes what is a, a part of Texas. And this is not even an official, you know, there's there's a disagreement between the United States and Spain as to what, how much of Texas. The United States actually claims much bigger portion of Texas is included, if not all of Texas in, is included in the Louisiana Purchase. And so that's a disagreement that's going to have to be settled, um, but it's not going to be settled right away. And so this whole time that the United States is here and has this territory, there's going to be problems with this group of people known as filibusters that are basically going to claim this territory and try to basically steal it, um, maybe for the United States, maybe for themselves. Um, and we'll talk about the filibusters more um, on another day. But we can see the beginnings here of this territory for Spain because they don't have a stronghold on it. They are they're in danger of losing much of this territory. So why did Spain's presence in Texas go from tremendously weak in 1800 to the brink of complete collapse by 1820? Well, Louisiana Purchase was our first reason, but it's not our only one. The people in Mexico, the people of New Spain, are wanting independence, and so they are beginning to fight for it. Um, That's kind of the earliest movements towards that are in the 18, uh, uh, early 1800s, 1810, 1811, we see. Um, Father Hidalgo, and we'll talk more about the war for independence, the Mexican war for independence that he starts off. Uh, and this is uh, a big problem because Spain is now losing its, it has, is in danger of losing its, its territory um, of Mexico. And this has been one of the most uh, productive parts of their um, empire. And so losing Mexico will be a great blow to Spain. And certainly that will include Texas. And so this is another reason why they're losing control or losing 
their territory is that the people of Mexico want independence from Spain, much like the people of uh, the United States wanted independence from Great Britain, much like the people of France wanted to overthrow their king in France. And let's just move on past that map. So just real quickly, kind of the social structure, we'll talk more about this when we talk about more, go more in more in depth with the Mexican independence movement. Um, but you've basically got four levels and, and it gets even more stratified, but the big four areas that we see here in Spain's social structure, those are at the, the, the highest of leaders, the highest social status are the peninsulares. And they're called peninsulares because they're from the Iberian Peninsula. That's where Spain is. And so these are people, these are Spanish people that are born in Spain and they are at the highest levels. There's only about, there's about 15,000 of them in 1800 in uh, Mexico. And so what that tells us is, and, and part of why they're at the highest level is because they've been in Spain. So they've got the closest connections to the most powerful families. They are some of the most powerful families in Spain. They have the closest connections with the king. And so they are the kind of the ruling class. The second most powerful are the Criollos. And the Criollos are also Spanish people, but they have been born, they were born in New Spain. And so part of their le lesson, the fact that they have less power is due to the fact that they have been away from the, the Spanish peninsula for so long. And so they do not have the same connections, the same social status. And so therefore they do not get the best jobs. And so the Criollos, are the kind of the next level um, that uh, in the social structure. The, the, then we've got the mestizos. The mestizos are um, have both Native American heritage and Spanish heritage. So a Native American parent and a Spanish parent. And this we've got about 1.5 million. So you know for uh, over 200 years, over 300 years, you've got Spanish. Uh, the Spanish the Spanish have been in Mexico, and so during that time, there are a there has been many people that are have both Spanish and Native American ancestry, and so this is a large portion of the population in New Spain. And then finally, we've got the Native American population, which is the largest population still, even with all the death from disease and, and the, the working in the, the silver mines and things like that in Mexico, even with that great uh, loss and difficulty, there's still 3.5 million Native Americans in Spain at this time. And they are the lowest social structure strat, uh, status in this social structure. So in 1811, there is a revolt led by Juan Bautista de las Casas. Uh, he led a revolt against the governor of Spanish Texas in 1811 and served as the head of the province for 39 days until he was deposed. Okay, so we see this revolution bubbling up from some of the lower classes in Spain. There's the Battle of Medina, uh, which is fought in 1813 between the Republican forces of the Gutierrez McGee expedition, which is a uh, kind of a uh, filibuster expedition uh, to a certain extent. We'll look more at this. Uh, these are Republican forces that are hoping to, you know, set up a republic in Texas uh, and uh, help to lead, you know, a this idea of of a, of a Mexican independence movement. And so uh, this is a, a the biggest battle in ever in Texas. You've got uh, fourteen hundred soldiers in. Uh, rebel soldiers, and you've got 1,800 Spanish soldiers, and you can see the results of this are 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 very bad for the rebels. Uh, all but about a hundred of them sur survive. I mean, only about a hundred survive. All the rest are killed. Um, of the Spanish forces led by General Arredondo, only 50 die, and so this is a a, a huge victory for Spain, uh, and really crushes this any chance of this uh, Republican movement in Texas from, from, from working out and, and really ends any hope for, for a while uh, anyway. So now, why did Spain's presence in Texas go from tremendously weak in 1800 to the brink of complete collapse by 1820? Well, major problem number three, Native Americans are rating increased dramatically. And so we've got problems with Native Americans, uh, you've got problems with 
uh, the United States is close by. You've got problems in all of Mexico where people are wanting independence. And then finally, the fourth answer here to this question is, well, the American filibusters that are coming over the border and Spain can do very little about it. Uh, and, and that Gutierrez McGee um, expedition, and, and by many standards, many consider a filibuster uh, movement as well. Um, there are some differences that we'll, you can see and we'll discuss more when we get more into the filibusters. So well, this is kind of just an introduction to the problems that we see in uh, New Spain and why they are having such a problem um, keeping control in this region.